yeah it's 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 yeah. really cool <laughs> yeah man on in on in how are you how you doing good good, good you know M maintaining my back's getting better went from a Cairo today feel good you know how are you? I was gonna ask. Yeah, I'm good. How was the Cairo? Like, did it? Did he like actually like crack you a bunch of ways? Yeah, he laid me on my side and I had to put my leg straight down underneath. And then he got on top of me and he kind of jumped and my back cracked. And then he put me on the other side and did the same thing. And I'm just getting old and like I need to be adjusted, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's weird. In my old age, I'm noticing like doing like yard work and and yeah, just basically like farm work and stuff. That like uh, a, a muscle will hurt in my hand really, really bad. And I can trace it like a guitar string all the way like to like my hip. <laughs> and you can like follow the like one, like it feels like a guitar string. Like it, it feels so bad. Yeah, but yeah, that's something all, that, that I've been learning in my old age. <laughs> we're all getting sin sinewy. I, sometimes I'm tempted to do like HGH, human gro a growth hormone, like a lot of older men do. And I'm okay. like, yeah, it's not good for your heart and stuff, but it. It yeah, that doesn't sound physique, cool. right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound very cool. So, um, yeah, man, where are you? Uh, where are you broadcasting from? I'm in uh, sweltering hot Hamilton, Haudenosaunee territory, Anishinaabe, dish with one spoon territory, uh, and yeah, I just wish we had a breeze here. I don't know what it's like where you're at, but here is really, yeah. It was yeah. really hot. The sun, uh, the sun was beating down really hard. But I, um, we got to do like two loads of laundry because we have like uh, our, our our dryer broke and like just in mid like mid COVID. And we've been calling to see like to get people to come out, but they've they've been kind of like apprehensive to like go into people's houses around here. Yeah. Anyway, so so we got a clothesline and uh, we got to do like two full loads with that with that sun today, which was which was nice. Yeah. But it's then uh, when we. Yeah, when we got in the garden, uh, it got uh, it got cool. Like uh, there was an overcast that kind of cooled everything down. It's amazing when you can use the sun like that. Like you realize, like you're you're so self sufficient. I gotta hand it to you, uh, you and your wife. You know the the way that you guys have like you really you th that technology is will never go away. And it's like you can rely on that. It's it's just me and Lucy should be doing what you guys are doing for sure. You know? Well, it's not, yeah, like farming just to grow food. This is new, right? This is new to, to the human beings, uh, uh, like to, to, to buy all of our food from, from grocery stores. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, like we, we would at least grow some of it in our yard, like, you know, tomatoes and, and, and lettuces and those sort of things. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting times, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I want to announce, uh, Bindigan, welcome, everybody. Wow, there's a lot of viewers already. Um, a few like housekeeping things. Um, Jesse, being the the famous writer and uh, famous speaker and also scholar that he is, is uh, extremely busy. And uh, unfortunately, we have to cut down our, our streams to uh, to once a week. Fortunately for for the world, because Jesse's not just doing those those work, but also uh, important community work also, which I'm really proud of you for, bro. That's really cool. Yeah, I want to say, I want to say something to that. It, yeah, we're please. we're we're minimizing our output, but we're increasing the magnitude of our guests, right? Like as mm. we have a world class guest today, so we're ramping it up. Even though we're reducing, we're still ramping it up. Oh yeah, on on that, like coming up, we got Rena Owen uh, from the hit series Siren. And from the incredible movie Once We're Warriors, that uh, I was a huge part of my upbringing, and and I, I I had a lot of pride watching that movie. That's for sure. So super stoked to hang out with her. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and uh, and did we announce the other guests, the 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 reunion? Have we talked about that online yet, or is this still? Uh, we might have mentioned it. I, I think you should announce it now officially, though. Okay, sorry. I, I let the cat out of the bag or spilled the beans. We're going to do a North of 60 reunion show. Uh, when, Ian? Uh, June 19th. And uh, it's including Tina Keeper and Dakota House. And uh, a lot of uh, fun friends are going to be dropping in and, and saying what's up. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, June 19th. Be sure to check that out. Amazing. Um, yeah, big shout out to uh, our producer, Kim Wheeler. She's a wonderful Kree Nishinaabe woman. 
uh, hanging out or no, holding a show. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, she's mad at me. Hold on. Hey, oh. Kim. Hi, <laughs> Mohawk and Ishinabe. <laughs> Mohawk and Ishinabe. Sorry about that. Uh -oh. Love you, Kim. Okay. <laughs> so we got Kim backstage hanging out. Uh, she's going to be filtering uh, all kinds of uh, um, your questions, your messages, links that we're talking about. So, uh, yeah, really excited to have Kim hanging out. And uh, please, if you're enjoying what's going on and, and, and the conversations we're having right now, if, you, if you've if you been into them, please share this link. Uh, share what you're watching, anywhere you're watching it, on Facebook, on uh, Instagram, or sorry, on uh, Periscope and on Twitch. If you can uh, share out the links, that'd be much appreciated. Yeah, at homies, uh, at homies chatting you know, on all platforms. It's the love of the people that watched it. It's kind of blowing up now and we just need your continued support. So it's kind of yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. So tonight, bro, we got a like legit rock star. Yeah. Like legit, <laughs> legit rock star. I know. I know. I watched this documentary today and I was, I was blown away, man. Yeah. Like, so he's not only a rock star. Oh. He's a, he's a movie producer that makes incredible movies. Right. That's like, again, like life changing, life changing movies that brings up a lot of that pride that you didn't know was there yet. Um, he's toured with uh, the biggest names, including Mick Jagger and, and Rod Stewart being the, you know, the, his, their their head guitarist or lead guitarist on, on stadium tours, which is mind blowing. But uh, yeah, there's so much that I want to bring up with Stevie. I don't know. Um, here we'll get into. Here's a bio. Stevie Salas is one of the best guitarists in the world. He has played with Mick Jagger, Justin Timberlake, T.I., and more. We'll get into that with Stevie. Yeah, Stevie, I, I can't wait to get into it, but I remember he was in, like, the, the top 100 guitar, best guitar players ever. Like, he's in, like, that, that league. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. He's a film, TV, and music producer, and he came from an age in an arena tour, or he came of age in an arena tour with Rod Stewart which Stevie documented in his book, When We Were uh, when we were The Boys. Yeah, When We Were The Boys. He's the executive producer of Rumble, The Indians Who Rocked the World. And uh, we're going to talk about that too. Uh, and most recently, he had a number one album on Japan's Billboard charts. Oh, and he's also on the cover of Rolling Stone Japan right now. So like, that like, yo, I'm big in Japan <laughs> is like legit. That's the truth. So let's bring in the homie, uh, Mr. Stevie Salas. That's on a, in, on in. That's a, <laughs> that's a guy. That was wow. like, a, oh, kill me now. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, bro? It's nice to see you. Yeah. Good, man. I'm, uh, I started traveling again last week working, but I've been home for a couple of months like everybody else. As you can see, I've, last time I got my hair cut was in Tokyo in February. Yo. <laughs> I'm in Austin, Texas right now. It's okay. Pool and I'm uh, here with, with with the brothers right now and Kim. Yeah. <laughs> is it so is it warm down? Oh, sorry. Is it warm down there? No, or how, how's the yeah. weather? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, good. Texas, is, Texas is hot when it's when it's hot everywhere else. It's hotter here, and when it's cold everywhere else, it's colder here. I'm in Austin, Texas. I saw you in Austin, Texas. Remember, I ran into you in Austin, Texas, in the street one time. I love Austin, Texas. Like, uh, the that, how weird was it not having the 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 festival this year, the uh, the South by? You know, I I unless I'm speaking at South by, I usually leave because you're just like at home, big, right? For me, it's like madness. I mean, like I did. You know, you gotta understand. I'm a hundred years old now. I I started doing this stuff, you know, you were talking about Rod Stewart. I mean, I was right out, I got out of high school in 1988. I was Yo. Playing, you know, so I've been doing this a long time. So when I get around that madness, if I'm there and I'm going to see people like you're playing or somebody's playing or something cool, um, I like it. But otherwise, I mean, I'd rather be surfing down in Costa Rica or doing something else or, you know, something. Mm, dude, that was the coolest meeting you. Like in, in the streets. In this, you know. I invited you to see Kim meet Kenny Loggins, remember? I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> but I was with the guy from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and you came up to me in the street. You're going, hey! And I'm like, oh, wow, what are you doing here? And you're like, we're playing at a thing down the road with Tribe. And, and I was like, shit, I got to go in here with this guy and meet Kenny Loggins. I said, come in, come meet Kenny Loggins. Yeah, I yo. I didn't want to meet him. I didn't blame you for not coming either. <laughs> that was so funny. That was just such a trip. Like, it was such a trip. Because uh, um, we have mutual friends in uh, Adam, in Adam Beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and it. Adam was like, yo, you got to meet Stevie. Stevie's a rock star. He played with Mick Jagger. <laughs> and he this was during uh, uh, American Idol. And you were the, the, the music director for American Idol. Yeah. I was a music director and a consultant for American Idol, uh, 2006 to 2010. Yeah, four years, four seasons. Oh, whoa! Did, Yo, uh, I did that's my first Daughtry, and I did about I don't know. We did five million records on that debut, and then I did Jordan Sparks, which we did about two million on hers, and then I did uh, David Cook, which was a million, and then I did Adam Lambert, which was a bomb. Adam Lambert was supposed to sell um, like three million records debut, like massive. And and we, I produced the segment on the American Music Awards when he did his first song. And I don't know if any of you saw it. It was like, you know, he, he he grabbed the bass player and decided to make out with him on camera, which, you know, he, he, he's a gay man, whatever, who cares? But he did it. I remember that, yeah. On the show and, and all hell broke loose. The album was coming out on that Tuesday. That was on a Sunday. We took a red eye and flew to New York City to do... Uh, the morning shows and we were canceled from all the shows and in the end he ended up only selling a half a million records because of all that yeah. wow there's a lot going on you're talking about what's going on now with you know black lives matter and all these things and even you know a gay man he decided to do that and he literally was blackballed for, for it like in and, and paid the price and he's fine now because he's the lead singer of queen and so he's rich as shit. but you know That's you cool. what what year are we talking about this happening 2010 it was the first year you ever heard of wow. Wow, yeah. that that's not that long ago. That's ten years yeah. ago. You know, that yeah. was my last year at Idol too. I was, I, I I like to pretend those were the four biggest years they ever had in ratings. So I like to pretend everyone was like, ah, you know, every, <laughs> and you bail out. Typical me. Tell you the truth, they had two country singers coming in the next year. I don't know anything about country, so there was no need for me. So really, they blew me out. But it looked cool. It looked like I left on my own terms on the big years. Right. I, I, I would have came back for the money. I'm a prostitute. <laughs> yeah man so you said that you started playing uh you started out of high school playing guitar for rod stewart yeah my first i had a high school band in san diego where i grew up i was really lucky you i know, lived in san diego for a while where did you live uh i lived in temecula for a long time and then i moved to um what was the beach pb uh pacific beach i lived in pacific beach for, for like a year you're having some good times there weren't you Pacific Beach was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's for sure. I bet it. But I, grew, I, mean, I grew up there and I owned a house on the beach in Carlsbad forever. I sold it a few years oh, ago. Oh, nice. But I um, was born there in Oceanside. So I grew up, I was lucky because my father um, left the country of Wyoming and, and when he was 17 and joined the military and was fighting the Korean War. When he came back, he worked in Camp Pendleton. My mother's family migrated from the Clifton, Arizona, up along the border of Arizona and New Mexico to San Diego, where my grandfather and grandmother had a little farm there in Vista. And then um, I was born on the beach in Oceanside. So I spent my whole life um, with black kids and Asian kids and there was no color there because of the Marine Corps base, right? There was like, mm -hmm. so I never had this issue and I surfed and, and I played rock and roll and I skateboarded with, you know, Tony Hawk lived around the corner and all these guys. And, and that was never a weird thing. You know, you didn't have to be any color to do that where I grew up. And, and then, um, the whole thing with uh, music. I mean, I, I was on the wrestling team in high school and the black guys would play me P-Funk and George Clinton there. Be, and I was listening to Kiss or Led Zeppelin and they'd be like, this is like the Kiss of, of black music. So, and ironically, <laughs> the first guy that ever hired me was George Clinton. So I knew all about George and Bootsy because of my black friends at my high school in Oceanside. So to me, it was lucky when you talk about all the madness going on in the country right now with the race and all this uh, where I grew up, it just we were all colorblind. We just you didn't. We all had every. We had friends of every color, and so because um, we were talking about that earlier, you know. Mm -hmm. What's it, what's it like in Texas right now? Do you know? Is it uh, popping off down there too? Yeah. What's the vibe in, in in Texas? Well, you know, you got you have Austin, and then you have the rest of Texas. Like Austin is like its own animal. It's a it's the big patch of blue and a sea of red, um, but. I, my house is about nine miles out in the country and I got, I got place out there, the, you know, a bunch of land and crap and deer running around and shit. And that's about all I see. I don't go into the city unless I have to. And, um, but there was some, there was some, there was some carrying on on sixth street the other night. And uh, people were telling me for a couple of nights there was some looting, you know, and I try not to like glorify too much because where, where's the looting about anger and where's the looting just about getting a free, free pair of tennis shoes, you know, and you gotta being a person of color myself, I want to make sure the message is always clear, right? And um, 
but I've been watching what's going on. And I've been very, very concerned, but I've been very concerned with what's going on in the United States for a long time. Cause I am now also a Canadian permanent resident. I'm both. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I Canada, didn't know that. Canada has been good to me. Uh, you know, for me, uh, they gave me an opportunity to learn how to produce television when I was doing Arbor live. I didn't know anything about mm -hmm. making television. You know, and they, they just gave me this thing. You want to do this? And I'm like, yeah, and they go, here you go. And I just knew you know, I, I, I think, I think, God for APTN because it gave me a new career. I would never have made Rumble if it wasn't for APTN <sighs> giving me those opportunities. So, so, and then in my rock and roll years, I had great love in Canada too because I was writing songs and doing Jeff Healy. And I wrote and had a lot oh, of big cool. hits with a girl called Sass Jordan in the 90s. So, yeah. Canada was always kind of good for me. Wow. So, you were in recording amongst like Canadian rock royalty as well, not just like. Yeah. International. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow, I, I, man. I used to go sit in Jeff Healy's stay at Jeff Healy's mansion on Spadina there, and and uh, we'd write songs, and we'd go lose our minds at night, and it was madness. And Jeff Healy was blind, but he was like on a whole nother level of. And you remember Jeff Healy, right? The blind guitar player, right? Of course. Was, yeah. yeah. I played Canada Rock. You remember Sarge Stock, the big Sarge? Yeah. Kid? Yeah. 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 I was there. The coronavirus, right? So I played that gig with the Rolling Stones and everything. And Jeff came and played with us, and and he died sh uh, shortly after that. It was he wasn't around that many more years, uh, a few more. But it was like you knew he was very sick, and he is a guy who is a true legend. You were talking about I'm not a legend. That guy, Jeff Healy, is like on another level of brain brains on a whole other. You know those those guys that you know you run into him. You travel around the world, and and you when you see a guy like that, he's a special guy, right? A special dude. Mm -hmm. For sure. Jeff Healy was massive. Like I remember uh, I had a neighbor who was like closely or uh, forget how it worked. He had Jeff Healy's band. The two brothers were over at his house hanging out one day and it was like, they're, they're not brothers, but they look like brothers. Yeah, that's Tom They're Jeff. not brothers. No, they're not. They look like brothers. Though. Wow. <laughs> they look exactly the same. You know, Tom, the, Tom was the manager and the drummer and he just put a book out a few months ago and I'm in it. And unfortunately it's really bad. He's talking about me and him and five women after a party and they're all naked. I'm like, Tom, what are you yeah. doing? There's a picture of me and him at the castle there. They live across from the Spadina castle. There's a picture of me and him all hung over in the morning. Like, I'm like Tom, like, what are you doing? You your book. But yeah, there you go. So you were touring with Jeff Healy um, after Rod Stewart? Never toured with Jeff Healy. I just I was oh. writing songs and tracking and, and going to a studio and recording with them and writing. I wrote a, uh, quite a few of their songs and I ghost wrote a couple bunch of songs with them. And then what would happen was I'd be on tour like with Duran Duran or Terrence Trent Darby and Healy and I would be in the same spot and I'd always go play with Healy. Like they'd always invite me to come sit in. Like the first time I met Jeff Beck, Jeff Healy introduced him to me in London, England at uh, Hammersmith Odeon. You know, oh, wow. and, you know, things like that. Um, I would, and when you got to sit in with Jeff Healy, all the great, great guitar players worship Jeff Healy, right? So Clapton would be there back and all this. Stuff. So if he would say, Stevie, come play with me, they'd be like, what the fuck is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> fuck off. I'm going to go play with yeah. Jeff. You know, yeah. That's so cool. Was I like remember a, super cool. I'm a fan, fan of great musicians. So for me, it was always like, God, I'm, I know how lucky I am. Yeah, he was. I remember his scene in um, Roadhouse. Pat, Roadhouse. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. that, Jesse? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where he had to play in front of the fence. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The old chicken wire. Yeah. Yeah. He did a That's scene there. Awesome. He grabbed a girl's boob, like pretended he was blind, and and him and oh, Pat no. a big old chuckled about it. It's like now he'd go to jail for that. Yeah, yeah, that's actual assault, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of movies and like '80s movies, I didn't know this, but you had a lot to do with like my favorite movie growing up, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Oh, that's your favorite. What? Movie? One of my all-time favorite movies. Um, started growing my hair because of uh, uh, Keanu Reeves in that movie. In the second yeah. one, when he grew his hair long. But it was like it was a huge, huge influence on me, like massive, and I, I didn't I'll know tell you that. About it. You Please, know, I'll tell you though. So okay, this is before Rod Stewart. Okay, in wow. In 1987, I wrote, was writing and producing a lot, working with Bootsy Collins and uh, and uh, a lot of people. 
Um, I was still a starving musician in LA, but I was, I was hot. You know, you know how it is when you get kind of hot, you're a buzz guy and I'm getting lots of calls. And I became a staff producer for a really amazing legendary producer named David Kirschenbaum. And David had produced and just, it was an A&R guy and he signed Joe Jackson and produced all the Joe Jackson and super tramp and all these huge records. He was a giant producer. And, um, David was a music supervisor and I, he knew nothing about hip hop and I, was one of the few guys in LA in 1987 that knew about hip hop because there wasn't a lot of hip hop in LA. I mean, there was Dr. Dre was doing like the LA Dream Team and and we listened to this station called L a Kindness, Joy, Love and Happiness, KJLH, it was Stevie Wonder's station. And you could barely get it. And they played all the dopest, like a late eighties funk and R&B shit, right? Like killer stuff, you know? And uh, Lakeside and all this stuff. And I loved that stuff, but I loved rock. And uh, Christian Baum says there's a film called it was either Action Jackson with Carl Withers and Vanity or mm -hmm. I remember big, that one. But he, but he goes, Do you know anything about hip hop? Rap? They all call it rap. I remember everything was rapping. I don't even know if they called it hip hop then. It's rap. You know anything about rap music? I'm like, yeah, actually, because my friend David Friendly was this white kid who's super into rap music and lived on the beach in Venice Beach, and he taught me how to sample. We would sample with cassette players. You put a cassette. And you would sample onto a, a sample that had like one second of sampling or two seconds where you can go like hit this button doom, 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 bam, 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 bam. you know that's all you could do bam, 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 you know, yeah right and but it was dope I and mean, nothing sounded like that when you did it and especially on cassette it had this tape compression it was rad so i go i know a little about hip-hop so i produced this track for these two kids named uh the west coast posse Two little kids, they were 16, 17. And Gene Page, the legendary Motown, you know, string arranger, Gene Page did all the big, he was, he knew these kids and I knew Gene. And so um, next thing I know, Atlantic thought, this stuff is dope. And they put it out, I put out a 12 inch and all this stuff. So all of a sudden I was the hip hop expert, right? I was a rapper, <laughs> right? I barely knew anything about it. But I knew, I knew how to make shit funky and I knew how to, like, it was cool, you know? And I loved Run DM DMC. Everything to me sounded like Run DMC. I put heavy guitar on it with no bass. You know, maybe an emulator three playing something weird. And um, and so I was doing that. And then he came to me one day in the studio and he said, um, there's a movie being made about this guitar. Uh, these kids who want to be rock stars, but it's really they're in school and they don't know how to play music, but it's a rock and roll movie. And they scored the movie and there's but there's no rock and roll in the score, he said. Um, so Randy Newman's nephew or somebody scored it and it was like a regular traditional score and they go, can you, can you rescore it? Or, uh, and I was like, what? Sure. So, okay. So I started getting the movie pieces from the director was Stephen Herrick, who now, you know, he did Rockstar and Mr. Holland's Opus, 101 Dalmatians. But this was only a second movie. He was completely unknown. And he would come, I was sleeping, I was sleeping on, in Beverly Wood on a futon couch. And I remember my dad was visiting me. And Stephen Herrick drove up in his little Toyota Celica. He wasn't even rich then. I, I met him during the making of Rockstar. He was at 9-11 and divorced his wife and had a you know 21-year-old supermodel for a girlfriend. So he drank the Kool-Aid and changed completely. But when he was young, he was like this regular guy, right? And he um, would come over and he'd bring over these video cassettes and we'd put them in on my TV and I'd grab an acoustic guitar. I remember my dad was sitting there and he would play like, this is a scene from Bill and Ted when they're the Beethoven's, they're giving a rally or something in high school and, and they want it to be like a concert and they'd have like a Led Zeppelin song in there, but they didn't have a budget. So you could never afford a Led Zeppelin song back then to license. So I would metronome it out and then I'd write a riff that sounded like it. How's this riff? And you go, that's a good riff. So I'd go in the studio that night and grab a drummer, Winston Watson or David Friendly or somebody and, and I'd just go cut it. And so I started replacing the music in the score and then I started scoring over the score, like the scene when they're in the cone uh, with uh, Fee Waybill and they're in their, they're in the, the their, uh, they do the song In Time. And you hear this guitar that sounds like The Edge coming in. Well, they couldn't afford U2, so they had a guy called Robbie Rob do the song In Time. But there was no, there was no Edge kind of guitar. And they wanted that. So I scored, you'll hear it now when you see the scene when, when they're the three like evolved, it's it's Clarence Clemens from Springsteen, yes, uh, Davis from the Motels, and Fee Waybill from the Tubes, and they're the they're the they're the elders. Yeah, or, yeah, 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 yeah. And you hear the U two guitar come in 
over the Robbie Robson. Yes. Movie. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I did all that. All right. That, that was in the, so the, when this Robbie Rob song came out, people used to go like, that's not the right version. Where's the version with the guitar? They all realized that that, that version doesn't exist. It's only in the film soundtrack. And I scored over the soundtrack. I scored over a stereo mix of the soundtrack. That's how much of a low budget Bill and Ted was. Okay, so things like that. We finished the film. Um, I don't think anything of it. I think whatever, you know. I'm back to doing whatever it is I'm doing, trying to get a record deal and, and doing my thing. And um, I'm still working at the studio. And then David Christian Mom comes to me about two months later and he goes, they're, they're testing Bill and Ted, but it's bombing. The ending's bombing. They need to reshoot an ending quick. So can you be in the Palisades tonight at 11 p.m.? I'm like, yeah. So I show up in the Palisades at somebody's house and they've taken the garage and they've got the Bill and Ted set from them in the garage when they jump around. Although I did all that too. You know when they jump around like, yeah, they can't yeah. play? Yo, hold on, hold on. Did you did you play the when they all, say excellent? That, anything that you hear that's <laughs> everything like, that's a sample. That's a sample of guitar. That's a sample of my guitar. So everything that you hear guitar in that thing is me. There was no there was no guitar in the soundtrack. So whoa. So this is the best. So you know the scene when they're when the scene when they're in the garage and like and they don't know how to play and they're jumping around and it's horrible. You know how I did that was every time that. I would try to score that. I tried to play shitty. And when I tried to play shitty, I sounded like a, a pompous asshole. I sounded like, oh, I'll play shitty. And I was, it just made me feel like I'm disrespecting Bill and Ted. I felt like everything I did sounded like some pompous 80s rock and roll guy trying to, trying to sound shitty, like, oh. And it made me sick to my stomach. I didn't want to be that guy. So I turned my guitar over and I played it left-handed. And that's how I did it. And I didn't know how to play left-handed. And that's how, that's what they, so all the guitar, you hear them jumping around, that's me playing with the guitar upside down. And that's why it sounds like, yeah. So that's, love it. Okay, so we go to the last night, we, we go to the scene and and, and I, I share a trailer with um, George Carlin and I dress in this matching outfit. And um, we share a trailer and um, I sit there all night and George Carlin and I talk all night. He tells me every amazing story. It's like the night of my life. George Carlin and me in a trailer together. Just, he's just telling me amazing stories about the time he was at the Academy Awards and he walked on stage and didn't say a word and for three minutes and the whole crowd erupted in laughter and he didn't say one word, you know, all kinds of amazing stuff. And then I finally go, I come out, Stephen Herrick comes and gets me and me and George. And uh, he goes, um, okay, Stevie, stand on this soapbox. And me and George were wearing exact outfits. Hang on, let me see if you can see this. I just found this picture I had to show you. So that's me and George. Oh, what? That's me and George in our same outfits on the set of Bill and Ted. George Carlin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so um, that's amazing. 1987. Yeah. 1987. This one, my hair was like that. So um, I go, what do I do, Stephen? He goes, I don't know. He goes, just move your hands, like, you know, play some crazy. So it's a comedy. So I did, I played air guitar, right? There was, I wasn't plugged in. So I just went like, I moved, first thing I did is hit A chord, like eruption. That's the first thing I could think of was Eddie Van Halen eruption. And then, and I went like, and, I, and then I just started moving my hands as ridiculous as I could. I thought it's a comedy. I don't, I'm going to just move it in unorthodox ways that make no sense. Cause it's stupid. It's silly. Right. He's and, also, and, and, he's supposed to be from the future also. Right. So he's yeah. supposed to be playing on like another yeah, level yeah, that yeah, you don't I'm even playing, understand. Like, like a fifties vintage guitar. Cause the director had some cool old school guitar. It was supposed to be the future. So, but so okay so so george carlin then they shoot george and they just shoot him from the neck up so when you watch the film next time you'll notice it's george only like this making faces and then it's my body and you'll see my my hands are brown and it's and it was summer so my hands were super brown because i was on the beach every day right so next time you see it you're like holy shit george carlin's face is super white and my hands are super brown and no <laughs> one ever said anything okay so so we shoot the film and like later that week I get the, the dailies from it and I go into the studio and I have to score this thing, right? And I'm like, oh shit. And I sit there and all I did was watch it and just like I just followed my fingers as best I could and just played whatever it looked like my hands were doing and I turned it in. Okay. End of story. Whatever. I forget all about the film. It doesn't because it doesn't come out for another year or something like that, right? Because it lost its distributor. We never thought it was going to come out. And then it came out and then it made a billion dollars. So it comes out. 
Um, I I don't like the film. I have a hard time liking anything I do. I, like I don't listen to records after I make them because I hear everything I hate about them and it gives me anxiety. So I don't watch the film. I start to watch it and I walked out in the middle of the film. Because I can't watch this. It's horrible. I hate it. Never watched it for years. Um, about 10 years ago, I'm in London, England. I'm sitting at a bar on one of my Hemingway trips with Jimmy Dunlap and I'm drinking tequila in the afternoon. And these rock and roll kids walk, see me and they walk in and I go, You're, are you Stevie Sauls? And I'm like, I'm like, yeah. And um, he goes, we just finished our college dissertation at, uh, at um, whatever the big music college is there. It's like their Berkeley School of Music there. And our end of our, our thesis was on this, your solo for Bill and Ted. And I'm like, really? And they go, yeah. They talked about how you went from a pentatonic to mixolydian to the blah, 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 blah. All this, whatever these things are that I never took a lesson, right? So I don't even know what they're talking about. And then I had to, I had to tell them, I go, I played air guitar. I, that wasn't written out. I just played air guitar. So they all thought this is a genius thing. It's genius. I played air guitar. It's all bullshit. So there you go. Girl, <laughs> anybody can make it. You just got to bullshit good enough. <laughs> I love that story. True story. Yeah. I love that story. It'd be a lot and I love that. It would be a lot cooler if I planned this solo out that seems to move so many people year after year. But I was fucking playing. No it. way. Eric. That's way cooler. And straight up, like it, it was so good that people wrote their like thesis on it. On some that you were just like fucking around with, like that's that's gold. That's Girl. how that's how good Indians are, bro. That's yeah, how yeah, good yeah. Indians yeah. are. I had the, I had the power behind me for sure. I had some good luck going. I had a horseshoe up my ass too. I was like, I was just a lucky, lucky guy that way, you know. I had a hard time as a child growing up with my mother, and and my father got me, and it just changed my life. And that's why I'm such an advocate of of parenting and and uh, responsible parenting and things like that. Because I see a lot of my friends that had a tough time and. I see what they struggle with, and and uh, I was a lucky person, and I know it. And things like that are just pure luck. So I don't want everyone to think that I'm like better than anybody else because I'm telling you, it could just happen to every. If I could do it, anybody could do it. Yeah, no, I I I totally understand. I'm not gonna say like I, I've done anything like to to this Stevie Solace like status, but like I've done some some pretty cool things, and I didn't really get to notice until I, I stepped away for a while yeah, and then like yeah and then people start talking and you're like oh yeah i guess like that's something that happened and that that's something that happened you don't really like understand it until you kind of take a step away from it True. but uh i wanted to i want to talk to you about hey, uh, comment on that because i knew yeah, what you please. Guys, and i would try to reach you guys and i knew that you guys were on this cusp when you were in tribe and you guys go, these guys are on the cusp i knew what that cusp is because i've been on that cusp there's a difference to get in, in, it's like being in a, a ball player in Canada and you're going to get in the NFL or being in the major leagues and you're in triple-A ball and you're just that close to getting in the big show, right? The big game, the big game. And then once you get in the big game, you're at the bottom again. It's really hard. And I was watching you guys. And, okay, now they're getting international. They got the timing's perfect. And I would write your manager and I'd say, listen, one song, one song, and it's all over those guys and it's it's you know block rock and beats and they're off and, and it's another game they're no longer native american djs they are djs who are native american that just you know what i mean they are in the game beyond that and and i could never get through to him because i was like man i want to you know my my manager managed uh you know uh, dead mouse and all these other guys i keep thinking there's got to be a combination we can get those guys with this guy and do something with it, you know and i just could never get through to him to understand that and i thought Man, one song is all it takes to change a person's life for the rest of their life, right? You know what I mean? But yeah, I was watching what you guys were doing. You guys are right there, man. It was like, it was for, it's for real. It's still for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're still touring and making music. I mean, you um, back to it though, and you could do it and you would be that guy. I, you have it in you to understand that level. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I saw it. I want you to know, I saw it big time. I want to ask, sorry, go ahead, Jesse. I just want to give a shout out to all the early risers in Japan that are uh, tuning in. They're up at eight o'clock in the morning to watch Stevie Salas talk and share these wonderful stories. And I just want to say respect to all the viewers in Japan for tuning in. Uh, it's a great honor to have you watch a, our show here. Yeah, yeah that's so the cool. Japanese love, love natives, man. The whole world does. Maybe North, <laughs> North America is the one that's the last to the to the to the game show, right? They don't get it. 
everywhere else they like they want to love you they want to give you I, just let me ask you but you know sometimes you got to listen to some corny questions you know what i mean about, you know, is it like know. that in japan it, do, <laughs> everywhere uh, jeff beck even said yeah the indians only took from the land what they needed and i'm like oh come on man don't say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> but you yeah. know he, but he, he was almost crying you know it's like the heart was in the right place oh, the heart's always in the right place and you feel bad yeah totally um i wanted to ask you about like parenting and touring because that's one thing that like made like i you know i had two kids grow up basically like they're you know 13 and, and 11 now and i was touring for most of their life and now i have a three-year-old and i've been off the road for two years now yeah. and i'm i like i the you know, I'm, I'm, I can honestly say I'm a way better parent now that I'm home instead of being away for eight months of the year, I, like, obviously. But I just want to know, like, how, how do you balance, like, being a, a good parent and, and touring so much? Like, you're globetrotting in, in a very real way. Well, I didn't. Here's I'll tell you. I didn't have a kid till I was 40 years old. I, I knew that I, I was married to my career. In an obsessive way that was it was unhealthy in a way. I was so obsessed, and I was never happy, and I was never satisfied. Mick Jagger calls. It was at a time when my girlfriend had died, and I hadn't touched the guitar in three years, and it was like a gift from God to get me to play again. And once I started playing, I started to to to, to think again. I was really like near death after this experience, and. Before that, I would never have a child because I knew that I could not do both and be successful. So I waited to have a child till 2007. And then I, I worked at American Idol. I stayed home. I stopped touring. I'd go on maybe a month here, six weeks to Europe or little stuff. And I stopped touring. And it's kind of the cuts on the street. Music changed a lot. Um, so touring wasn't fun, as fun for me. And now in the last three years, I've been developing film and television like crazy. I'm writing a lot. I'm working with like the guy who just directed Maleficent and the other guy who just produced The Post and he's producing a new Will Smith movie right now. I just hung up the phone with him, you know, 10 minutes before we, we got on this call, you know, and this is a new career for me and it's taken a lot of my energy, but my son's already 12 years old. My son and I fly home all the time. That's why you see me flying so much because I'll fly in a, for a meeting and if I have a free day off, I fly home and then I'll fly back. Um, and cause you're right. You, you, you go away for two years, you come back and a kid's got a mustache. You miss that. <laughs> it's true. Yo, yeah. like I, I, uh, I went for, I, w I went on the road for two weeks when my baby was two weeks old and I came home and she was twice as old <laughs> you know? and it was just like, yo, this yeah, is, exactly. this is, exactly. yeah. You, you know, you do what you can and, and, um, cause you got to make a living, right? Cause you, because if you're broke, it's hard to be a good dad too. But mm. at the same time, I just waited till I was much older to have a kid. And I would have been a shit father. I, I, I think I'm a really good father. I work really hard at it. It's my most important thing in the world to me. Um, and I try really hard. And I was lucky I had a really good father. He was such a good dad to me. Um, but I would have been a shittiest father if I would have had a kid at 23. I was all over the planet, man. I was playing Madison Square Garden. Just like, who is this? Don't talk to me about it. You know, it was like, I would have been the worst. And so I'm glad that I waited and I know it's not easy. And and then also I picked a really good mother. I, my son's mother and I aren't a married couple. She's my friend and she was wanted to be a mother and I knew she was the most fabulous human being. I knew she'd be a great mom and I helped her. And then I thought, I go, I'll do like David Crosby and Melissa Etheridge or something. I'll, 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 I'll come in on the weekends and peek in. Hey, that's a little guy. You know? As soon as he was born, I, I could not be with him. So I got her to quit her job. I pay for everything and she takes care of our boy. And, and, and I, I'm there to make sure that, you know, he knows how to fight and knows how to cuss and all the stuff he shouldn't know how to do. And she takes care of all the real stuff. Like, you know, helping with his math. I can't even, the math today, are you kidding me? It's like, I have no idea what's going on. Hey, can I ask you about like your, uh, your documentary that you made and like cool. how did you get inspired to write that and like produce that and because like man i watched that today and i was getting emotional mm -hmm. literally and i don't get emotional over like visual stuff and like just the way you're talking about hendrix because i grew up i loved hendrix because he was indigenous and like it just blew my mind man like could you talk a little bit about that and yeah 
Rumble um, around 2000, I, I, 1999, I, I made what I thought would be my last album. I was sick of the music business, I was tired of it. I, I, you know, I, 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 kinda, I was kind of rich, so I had money. So I could be like, fuck this, I don't want to do it anymore. And um, I played the Fuji Rock Fest, which was at the time was the newest, biggest, most biggest global thing. And me and Rage Against the Machine, a whole bunch of us, we all played. And I said, this is it for me. This is it. My last gig. And if you ever watch Fuji Rock 99 on YouTube and see my set, you'll notice I never say a word to the crowd. I told my band, I told everybody, I'm going to walk up there. It's my last show. I'm not going to say one word. I'm going to use the force like Luke Skywalker, this shit. And I'm just going to look at them. There was like 35 or 40,000 people. And I just look at them. I'd stand there and just look at them until they'd go berserk. And then I'd hit it. And it was my best moment ever as an artist. And I, I feel like I hit the top of the mountain and I said, that's it for me. I'm done. And, um, and then the two stock, 2000 stock, stock market crashed and I lost a million dollars in the stock market. And I was like, oh, fuck, what am I going to do now? And I'm broke again. I wasn't broke, but I was like, ah. So I had to seriously consider then my girl died and then I couldn't work. And, and um, I, I started to think I need to, I need to do something in Indian country. Cause if you saw in rumble, Indian country was my balancing point where mm -hmm. in the nineties I would, you know, I started to get too into like, what movie star am I trying to date? Or what am I doing with this money? And I'm drinking all the time, I'm doing drugs. And I'm like, I get to get lost in that stuff of my own bullshit, which is, it is, it's all just bullshit. Cause it really that's is about- That's a rock star. Yeah, that's it's all bullshit, but it's fun. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, not have <laughs> yeah it's being a rock star, of course. Yeah, so I, I, um, I went and I said, I need to go back to Indian country and need to get my shit together. And then I started to think about my my friends in Taos and stuff. And I started to realize that like, I go, you know, there's all these role models that n none of my friends know about. And I want them to be inspired. So I started to think maybe I could write a um, coffee table book or something to show that just the native people, they can have this thing. Like, oh, who is Buffy St. Marie? Oh, you know, Randy Castillo, or whatever, you know? And then I went to open for the Rolling Stones at the SARS gig in Canada with ACDC and, mm -hmm. and you know, half a million. I was there. I, I was there. there. I was there. I too. caught, I caught, uh, uh, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie Woods. Woods. Yeah. I caught his pick and I gave it to my dad. <laughs> yeah. Did you, Did you see yesterday, uh, two days ago on Facebook, there's a picture of me and Ronnie in the studio because it was his birthday. Go look at my yeah. cool shot of me and Ronnie. Um, so cool. Go. You were there, okay? Well, I was there too. I played, and he, and, and Jeff Healy played with me that night. And so, um, I started. I met a guy called Brian Wright McLeod, and Brian Wright McLeod is from Ontario, from from Toronto, native guy. And he was writing a book, which I'm sure you're in, um, about every bit of Native American recorded music going all the way back to 1908, um, and wax cylinders, and a re it's like an encyclopedia of Native American music. It's called. And it's really a, a, a scholastic thing. It's not an entertaining book. It's like a lot of information. And he wanted me in his book. And I met him. And that's when he sat down and said, man, check out Jesse Ed Davis and check out this. And I was like, oh, I kept thinking, man, I got to do something with this. I got to do something with this. And um, about 2006 or 2000, I don't know what year it was. I trying to figure out, oh no, I got, I hooked up Brian with Jake Gold, who's a big manager in Toronto. And, um, and Sass Jordan, who I'd worked with, was doing uh, Canadian Idol at the time. And I was working with Kalen Porter, who had won Canadian Idol, trying to help him produce his new album and get his shit going. And um, I was tried, I hooked up Brian Wright McLeod with Jake, who was on Canadian Idol, a big manager, managed to tragically hit. And they tried forever to get, a t they tried to get this miniseries made forever of what Rumble became, right? And they couldn't get it done. So I, helped Kenny Hill and Six Nations uh, with his studio he built, Jucasa. I, I was producing a band in Central America and I found that SSL board from uh, Abbey Road in England and I called up Kenny. World said, famous studio, yeah. world mm -hmm. famous studio. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, Jucasa, yeah. And I said, I, I found Abbey Road Studio 3's mixing board sitting here in, in, in abandoned in these cases. And he flew down and met me in Costa Rica and I have a bunch of land in Costa Rica. So that was my, my place, that's my go-to place. And, uh, and he came and met me there 
And we, we bought this board and took it to Six Nations. And um, when the studio opened, he asked me to fly in and give a speech. So I flew in, I was camping with my kids in Lake Tahoe and I flew down to Six Nations and I gave this speech and I talked about, one of the things in the speech was is that I travel around the world and there's always these native people trying to get one native into the mainstream, get one on TV, one on Jay Leno, one. And I kept saying, that's not what you do. I go, people love our culture. Let's bring the mainstream to the Indian. And, and, and Tim Johnson was there. Tim Johnson, who was the head of the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. And like a light bulb went off in his head. And he came up, introduced himself to me, told me about the, told me about the museum and asked me if I'd come visit DC and see the museum. So I, I, a week or two later, I flew out to DC and uh, I um, hung out with them and walked the museum. And I thought, oh, it's, it's a fascinating, beautiful place, right? And then he says, come on, let's go down and take a train. I mean, it's the same afternoon I'm there. He goes, let's go get on the train and go to New York City. I want you to see the museum there too. Go, okay, so about five o'clock, four o'clock, we jumped on a train in New York. And um, I told him about Brian Wright McLeod's book. And I told him about Brian Wright McLeod and, and the story of these, these un, they were unknown Native Americans who were known to every musician in the world. Mm. but not known to anybody else. If you were talking to John Lennon, he was talking about Eddie, Ed, you know, he was called him Indian Ed, which, you know, he didn't mean, mean it to be a racist name, but he was Indian Ed. He was at Jesse Ed Davis, his favorite guitar player, Elton John, you know, they, all these guys, they worship these musicians. So Tim Johnson said, let's, let's do, let's do an exhibit at the museum. So I go, great. So all of a sudden I took a job at the, at the Smithsonian. Like, what I barely graduated high school. Right? So I take a job at the Smithsonian. I develop this exhibit with the Smithsonian and we flesh out our story and it's called Up Where We Belong Natives in Popular Culture. It's supposed to run for three months, but it became the most popular exhibit they ever had. And um, they said, let's move it to New York and we'll make it four times bigger. And it ran in New York for a year and it was huge. So after it's run, I knew I needed to make a movie about it. And Brian and Jake hadn't gotten it done. So I, by that time, was already doing Arbor Live and I, I was learning about TV. And I was home at my house in Niagara on the Lake, which is near, uh, mm -hmm. near in Ontario, this little town called Niagara on the Lake. It's a cool little town where the War of 1812 was fun. I had a house there. Yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love it there. I love it. I loved it there. Me and my little boy would go to the park every day and he'd run every day and ride his bicycle. It was the best. I loved it. And uh, I got a call from uh, Christina. Fawn from Red yo, Red I want to yo. She's in here. She's uh, she's in the she's in the chat. There you she's go. Heads up. Yeah, don't yeah. Let, she's hanging up. On, don't let her on live though, man. She'll kill her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding, Christina. Um, so Christina calls me because Adam Beach gave her my number because Christina's company also does uh gaming and stuff too. And I had an app out. I was one of the first guys to have a guitar app out on Apple. And um, I, it was like pretty cool. I made some money. It was kind of cool. It was like a game where I was this avatar and I, you try, I, it was like Simon Says or some shit. I, mean, I didn't do it. I, I was just a person they used and I made money from it. But this, these genius guys created and did it. So yeah, because we're doing apps now. And I'm like, I don't want nothing to do with apps. I already did that. I don't want to do that now. I think that it's going to get old. I go, I'm trying to make a movie. She goes, well, we make movies. And she goes, uh, we made Real Engine. And I go, oh. One of my favorite movies again. There you go, Christina. <laughs> there you go. So, so she sent me Real Engine. I watched it, and I said, "That's me." And we met. And what happened was her and Catherine, who directed Rumble, went to Toronto to uh, Hot Docs or, or, or some kind of a thing where you, all the networks were there and you pitch. And I, I drove up from Niagara and Lake, and I met them there, and they sat me down in front of every single network, and I pitched the story of Rumble. And ironically, every single network said yes. So then Christina was like, oh my God. So now she had to figure out, because in the exhibit at the Smithsonian, I brought a lot of star power and they knew that I'd have, you know, Taboo and Steven Tyler and, and you know, all these famous people were in the film because mm -hmm. these people loved these musicians. They loved them. We didn't even know about them and everyone else worshiped them. And we feel like, oh, we, nobody, nobody likes us or nobody cares a shit about us. And we, these guys were worship. I mean, Worshipped by the best. Jesse Ed Davis played with all four Beatles, the only person in history that's done that, you know, mm -hmm. separately. You know, I mean, come on, a Native American guy, he's a Kiowa Indian, he played with all four of the Beatles, and you don't, nobody knows his name. I mean, that's really weird, right? That is weird. Like, we don't yeah. know our history like this. And that's why, like, your movies are so important like this. Well, this one is, I'm going to just make regular movies now that make me money because documentaries are hard. But yeah, I did my share. I did my job. You guys take over now. 
I'm gonna go out and make like movies about guys, you know, killing people and having fun. Um, but- we got to make movies about you now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Good cartoon character, baby. But uh, so we made we made Rumble. I get together with Christina. It took us five years. It was the hardest thing in the world to make. Um, I was adamant that we were not going to make a victim film. I didn't want it to be a film about these guys. Yeah, you stole our music and you stole this and you screwed us over again. I didn't want to make that movie. I wanted to make a movie about heroes mm. because these guys were heroes to the people in the film. And then the reason that I had so many famous people in the movie was I would say to everyone, because the Canadians were like, forget all the famous people, forget that it's about the story. You know, Canadians are in the hearts are in the right place, but I'm thinking how am I going to get this story seen? Because right. they're right. The story should be strong enough without famous people telling it. But I know how the world is. And the world needs famous people to go, what? what's this movie with all these people in it? I'll watch it. And then they learn something, right? But the, the thing was, is that the famous people, if, if you say, okay, it's like some kid says to me, oh, man, DJ Indian is uh, the best DJ of all the DJs. And I don't know who this kid is. I'm like, oh, really? Well, I'll check him out. But I don't know. Fucking, you know, if uh, if uh, if uh, DMC comes up to me and goes, I saw this dope DJ, DMC, uh, DJ Indian was crushing me. I eat me. I'd be like, really? Where I got to meet this guy, right? So it those people vouched, right, for non-believers to think, just to think about checking into this. So Eric Clapton says that uh, Jesse Ed Davis is a genius, you're going to say like, Eric Clapton said that? I got to check this guy out. If I say it, you're going to be like, nah, fuck that. It's a race thing. He's an Indian. That guy's an Indian. He's just saying it because they're Indians. You know what I mean? It couldn't be a race movie. It couldn't be a race movie. It had to be a story of heroes. And we tricked everybody into learning about the history, if that makes any sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. That's how Tribe, like, that's how we, like, got a lot of our our points across was, like, you know, during a a dance party, we'd show a lot of, like, racist imagery behind us, and people would start putting together these racist imageries and and putting it together themselves. Same thing, same thing. Mm -hmm. If you really go back and listen to my old records, there was always things about who I was as a human being in there. It just wasn't about, I wasn't pounding that in your face. If you cared to really listen, you could tell what I was talking about, and it was there. And or if you look like Randy Castillo, let's just say, played with Ozzy. Yeah. Like I didn't that, know he was Indian. And I go, what's that, look? That blew my he mind. Like his turquoise earrings <laughs> on. He's got like his thing on. If you just looked, it was there for us to see. And that was there for us to see. He was doing that for us. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. And we weren't seeing it. You know, we weren't seeing a lot of this stuff. And then once I looked, Jesse Ed Davis plays Madison Square Gardens. Okay, he plays it's with George Harrison on the Bangladesh concert. One of the biggest records in the 70s of all times, okay? I've watched it a million times on TV. There's Eric Clapton on one side, George Harrison, there's Ringo Starr, there's, uh, uh, what's his name, you know, uh, the keyboard player, the insane keyboard player uh, that just died. Um, up on the tightrope, you know, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now. Famous, famous guy. Um, all okay. the famous legendary musicians. I've seen it a million times. Now when I see it, I see George Harrison here, Eric Clapton here, and I see a six foot Indian right next to him, right there, that's been there the whole time, looking like an Indian too. Not like he's looking like just like, you know, he's an Indian and he's dressed like one. How did I never see him? He was there. All these people were there and, and they were, but they were like invisible until we like, we like yeah. flipped the switch and they were out of phase and they're in phase and there they are. And now you see Rumble, you're like, oh. Yeah. yeah. It- Oh, and it, but it was always there. It just, they were like, it was like they were out of phase with yeah. the world and, and like rumble, put them in phase and they're all there now. Yeah. The- <laughs> it was like a, it was like a trick, trick you guys did, you know? It was like, well, I don't know. I think the yeah. gods are with us. Cause I, we got lucky, man. And Christina Fawn was the person she, she raised all the money and Christina, um, Chris, Catherine and I were arguing a lot, the directors and, and Fonz even, Fonz quit. One of the directors quit for a long time um, because they had their idea what they wanted to make. And I had an idea what I wanted to make. And Christina started to understand that my idea was not that different from what they wanted. It was just worded differently. And it wasn't a race film. As soon as 
as soon as me, as soon as a native guy tells him, I saw a film when I was a kid about rock and roll and a, 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 a black African-American musicologist said, Elvis was a racist, he ripped off a little Richard invented rock. And it came from a negative place. And, and it bothered me because I like Elvis and I like, I love little Richard, but it came from a negative place. And I go, don't want to be that guy. I don't want to make that movie. I don't want to do that. I want to make a movie and let everybody got to get tricked into learning about it. And, and it was, it was a struggle, but Christina Fawn made this uh, trailer based on my talking with her secretly and the trailer changed the world. Steven Tyler saw the trailer and all these people go, this movie's going to be huge. We got it. Then everybody had to do it. And then once you had Steven Tyler, then like, or, you know, Tommy Lee's like, oh, he's in it. I want to be in it. You know, that's how it works. I, oh, he's in it. I'll do it if he's in it, you know? And so you, you get to some of these guys and then everybody wants to be on the, in the game and everybody feels good and they all love Native Americans and they're all, this is a win, 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 win. And I was just lucky enough that I had a Rolodex that I could call those guys. Mm. Mm -hmm. But they didn't do it for me. They did it because the information was important to them have you seen on netflix that uh hip-hop evolution did you watch that documentary i did hip-hop yes. yeah well uh, actually like past homies chatting guest is uh is shad the the guy who hosts that and uh he's a he's a one of my my like closest dearest friends and he said the same thing happened with with that show was like you know the first season happened and it was really hard to get like people to come on but he got a few like old heads and then once the old heads were on then all the young people started like yo we got to get on this and then the phone calls started coming out yeah yeah, yeah yeah so it's funny that's funny that's how it works though you know the thing, you know i did recently i played this gig with dmc from run dmc and um i was the music director for it and i knew run was coming and i brought mark mcgrath and they do this thing where where, where they do this run dmc whole thing together and it's really fun and we were at a big private party we were playing and so eddie martinez was the guitar player that you see in all those old Run DMC videos, a black guy that played with Robert Palmer and everything. But he's the guy that did all the guitar on those records. So I called Eddie Martinez and I brought Eddie Martinez to surprise DMC. And Eddie Martinez played guitar and we did Run DMC set with Eddie playing guitar and then DMC felt at home. And you know, you just create these atmospheres, these things where everyone can enjoy themselves. And um, and it's, a, it's just, it's a win, 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 man. Yeah, I think playing any party with Run DMC would like, <laughs> yeah. bro, your stories are just so like it's crazy, incredible. I yeah. You want to hear? I'll tell you a good story that has nothing to do with with me, because that that stuff for me is exciting too. It's incredible for me too. I, I was just as believe me to play the King of Rock with him doing that was like I was back there dying. I was like a five year old. <laughs> so, um, there was a whole hip hop section in Rumble that we had to cut out because when I was when I was young. Um, my first few solo albums were produced by a guy called Bill Laswell, who's like this legendary guy that worked with the drummers at Jujuka and Africans. And, you know, he did, he produced the Herbie Hancock Rocket and he did Africa Bombada and Johnny Lydon Time. I'm in a time zone. I'm a, you know, Laswell's this crazy guy. And um, so he, um, um, I got to know, you know, Africa Bombada. Uh, and, and another guy that used to come to the studio every day when I was making my first album was um, was named, um, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now. He was the DJ, the famous DJ. I'm blanking on his name right now because it, it'll come back to me. Um, but Grandmaster Flash? No, 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 no. No, more of an underground guy. He's in Blondie's song. Um, hang on, hang on. I got it here. I, I, it'll come to me in two seconds. Um, cool, Herc. It'll come to me in a second, but hold on. But my point is, is that African Bombada uh, and Melly Mel, you know, the, you know, in, on Long Island, there's a whole, the whole tribe out there of, of black, black Indians. I mean, they're most people just think they're African American, but they're they're straight up card carrying Indians living on the res, and they're they're all look like African Americans, right? So they've been confused forever, right? They they're not confused. People have been confused about them forever, you know, right? So they're doing hip hop. The, all those guys came from there, from Long Island. And they said, African Bombada and Melly Melanin said they didn't have words back then. This is going to blow your mind. So they were being natives. They were then to Buffy St. Marie because she wrote the lyrics. And they used to put on the beats and use Buffy's lyrics. And they all wanted, Christina Fawn took them to meet in, in New York to meet Buffy. They all wanted to meet Buffy. Buffy. 
right? We all we all want to meet Buffy. I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> her ass too. She's so tough. She used to call me. It's TV. God damn it! You need to blah blah blah. That is Buffy, of course. Buffy. Um, so, but they re- worshipped Buffy. So here we is another native person that had a huge influence on hip hop that we didn't even know about. Because mm-hmm. all those guys, a lot of those guys are all mixed in with those uh, brothers from the Hamptons. Yeah, I, uh, my cousin actually, like my my legit like cousin, not just like somebody from my my community, but like my legit cousin, uh, Q Rock. He uh, he's a big break dancer, and actually he just got back from from uh, China or Japan, like a f- just before like Corona hit and all that. So he he, he just snuck out, but he's a uh, he's a big break dancer, and he uses a lot of traditional dance moves in it. And he was actually one of the uh, Zulu Nation guys. There you go. With, there you go. There you go. Yeah, and he told me the story about like the history of that word hip hop. He's like he knows like the the people who came up with that term, and they said that they got that after coming from a pow wow, and it was that like those two words they, they like they copied those two words to make it your their next own movie, thing. Yeah. You make the movie. You're the hip hop guy. You need to make that movie. Make a miniseries <laughs> about it for real. I'm telling you, it's a legit, it's a legit claim, and you can go get. Well, we had to cut Africa Mombata out of the film. I loved Africa Mombata, but in Africa, Resolution Pictures is a is all mostly ninety nine percent female run company, and at all respect, and they have every right, and I didn't blame this, but Africa Mombata did something stupid and and beat up his girlfriend, and it came in the press, and the girls were like, "Oh no, he also like raped kids, like it was a bad thing." I didn't even know about that, but they were like, yeah. "Get rid of it, get rid of him, you know, get rid of it," and, and yeah, we had to. Uh, DST was the DJ that used to hang out with me in the studio. DST. Um, DST. Okay. And um, so there's a whole story to be done on hip hop in Indian country, big time. You should do it. Both you guys, you can do it on. I will. I'll write it I'll for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let me consult speaking. Where speaking. Yeah. Do anything. Speaking of writing. Oh, is this your segue that you're you going to use Ian, or no? Yeah, about his book. Yeah, and that's I want to like. So Jesse, um, Jesse's the biggest writer in Canada right now. His book is number one, has been number one for months now, really? um, and it's yeah, and it's an autobiography. Yeah, this Jesse right here. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Patience. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's <laughs> legit like the number one author in Canada right now. And it's just it's just wow. so rad. <laughs> and he's, that's but, amazing. Yeah, man. But I want to talk about both of you and 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 uh, like biographical writing and like how because you you were writing road stories right and Jesse like you were still talking about like you know parts of your life and and like around the same ages I'm guessing too right like you yeah, so yeah. so Jesse Jesse's book like he he got street involved he got uh, uh, you know he the, it's a lot of hard living in, in that book mm-hmm. uh, highly recommended it. it's brilliant I really really that. I'll get that I'll get that for sure I'll get that yeah 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 but. Um, yeah, so so writing your book, like how was how was that process? Was it just like writing down road stories? Because I know about road stories. <laughs> no, no, because you know you're a songwriter. When you write a song, you have to think about how am I going to make this interesting enough? I want it to be funny, but really, it was a memoir about a year in my life that changed my life forever. Uh, but I had to tie in the things that. I had to find ways to tie a satellite in all these things that happened in odd ways that, that made all this happen. Meaning like, okay, I'm here. Why, why was I, you know, why did I have thick skin or why, you know, and I can think back, oh, well, cause when I was born, I was being strangled as a child. So I, 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 I uh, was dying. They thought I was going to die and I didn't die. And so in my subconscious, I'm thinking I've had my first victory. Mm-hmm. I can win. I can win. I'm not, I can do this in my subconscious mind. I really believe that because I was I was near death when I was I was kind of going to be dead. So I tried to tie in these things that made it possible because I shouldn't have not I shouldn't have been on that Rod Stewart tour. I had no business being on that tour. It was my first. Band. So I went from my high school band to the biggest band in the world. Um, David Bowie's bass player, Carmine Rojas, did Let's Dance. He was the bass player. His his poster was on my bedroom wall at my mom's house when I joined. <laughs> I mean, I did not belong in that band. It was like, but Carmine came up to me at rehearsal when I auditioned and he said, I saw you walk in and he pulled me aside and he goes, I, I don't know what it is because I feel like you, you need to do this gig. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I need to do this gig. <laughs> but he says, 
he reminded me of my little brother and my little brother died in my arms in Brooklyn and I was carrying him to the hospital and he died in my arms and when you walked in I saw you and it just, you look like my you were like reminded me of my little brother that's how I got the gig I, I sucked I had no experience I mean I had a little I had I had a hood spa and I had like I had something the same stuff that worked on Bill and Ted but it, but that's a seasoned gig man that is like come on I had to play Maggie Mae and these are intricate pieces of music and I'm up there like zing, like you know tight pants and whatever so it was a life-changing experience that year in my life. And so I wrote about the memoir. I was able to, and luckily I had a diary because I had a feeling when I was a kid that it's the only time I ever wrote a diary. I wrote that. I documented everything I did every day that year on that tour. Every day I wrote that. What did I do today? And, you know, went to dinner and blah, blah, blah. And I met Jimmy Page and, you know, and it was cool. Wow. Played me a Led Zeppelin song. You know, everything I wrote down. So I could remember at, when it happened. So in my book, it looked like I had my shit together because I did the days and took all this, but it was just lucky. I had this book that I wrote and, and that's what I did. And it was the hardest thing in the world I've ever done. And I don't think I ever want to do it again. Yeah. Writing a book is really hard. I can attest so to hard. that. Yeah. Yeah. How did, did they approach you or did you go with your manuscript to them? How did that happen? I got approached just the same way I did a TV show. AP 10 approached me with a, a, a writer who knew, grew up with me in San Diego. I had written lots of books with, uh, as a, as a co-writer with professional surfers and all these people. And he's like, you had to do a book. And I was like, for a long time, people had said that. And I was like, well, if I can do a book that can inspire people to know that anything is possible, that's a book I want to write. But it was hard because some of my book, you know, like people write me sometimes and say like, man, you, you know, you really were with a ton of chicks. Because I was, I was, I, I was being honest, what was going on. And, but I was puzzled by this. Why were all these, why were there 15 naked girls running down the hallway at the Four Seasons? These are weird, they were new things to me. It sounds silly now. And I'd be like, call my friends back home. Like, you won't believe this. I'm like, why? And I, I had no idea why. Uh, but it was like, I had to be honest. And in a way, I was a victim. I tell people, I go, those girls weren't victims. I go, any more than I was. And I was a victim of my own stupidity and naivety and, and youth. And I learned a lot, you know, so... It was like, it wasn't meant to sound like a book of bragging, but if you really wanted to know what it was like on tour, you know, right down to the, the Playboy centerfolds and all the rest of the madness on the jets and all that stuff, I had to write that real book. And um, it was, and I tried to make it funny because to me, the whole thing was just hilarious. It was a joke. I mean, you know, guys dancing around Rod Stewart showing up on stage in, the, in high heels in a dress. Like, like, what is he doing? Is Elton John showing up and they're like dressed the lipstick and you know what's going on here it's like it was madness just madness and and there's no rhyme or reason to that kind of madness and you don't see so much of that kind of madness anymore and why did you pick the year is that the just the year that you were on tour the year of, i was only i joined rod's band which was the gig of a lifetime and a month after i joined i got this massive recording contract with island records and i had to keep it a secret because i didn't want rod to find out and get to fire me and um so I, I finally, at the end of the, the big leg of that tour, Island Records said to me, are you going to be your own musician? Are you going to be his guitar player? And I had, I, I had to quit. I, had, I didn't want to quit either because I was a little kid and those guys were all, the next youngest guy was 10 years, old, 10 years older than me. And they were like my big brothers. And we were like an army, man. And we'd go everywhere, you know. And they were going to South America and it was all stadiums. And I'm like, where am I going to see South America staying at the this, this St. Regis in a suite with, in a private jet. And I mean, I may never see that again. And, and I knew that that might have been the only time in my life I could see life at that. Because I, I grew up a poor kid, you know. I grew up, I had a good life, but it, it nothing like that, man. We had a private jet, we had a private plane. We had, you know, it was amazing. Five nights at Madison Square Gardens. And you know, you know what it's like, you show up, there was no anxiety. Or, or we, every show was sold out. So I never showed up and went like, is there anybody out there yet? Shit, small crowd, I got a stomachache. You know how that is, right? You know, you show up on tour and you're like, oh, we don't have any tickets, I suck, I'm so embarrassed. Oh yeah, yeah. So none I know of all about that. <laughs> we all do, and you know, it's the worst. <laughs> For sure. Um, I want to talk about like Japan. Yeah. So like you, you have a like a, a huge album in Japan. Like number one, you're on the cover of Rolling Stone. <laughs> yeah. That Yo, great? yeah, that's that's crazy. amazing. Yeah, That's so dope. Well, you know, I don't know what happened was, but in 1990, my first album, Color Code, came out. And, and for some reason, it, it was critically acclaimed, and it still is, it, 
but it didn't sell huge except for like maybe in Germany, France and Japan. And back then there was no internet. So I spent a lot of years going to France and Germany and England and to um, Japan. And I would get off the plane in Japan and I'd get attacked at the airport. And, but there was no internet. So nobody knew what was going on. Everyone thought I was a loser. Like, oh, his album bombed. He's not, he's only selling, you know, he sold 300 tickets at, at the Viper Room tonight. But over there, I'm playing like 2,000 seaters multiple nights. And so I come home and like Steve Lukather, I remember one time said, is he a drug dealer? Where's he getting all his money? So I, was driving around and I had 500 bands and I had the whole bit in Hollywood Hills house and a beach house. And everyone's like, you know, they didn't know because there was no internet. So nobody could see me playing the thousand, multiple thousand seaters. And, um, and my friends would know, musicians would know who would go to Japan and see that. Um, but nobody knew and nobody knew back home. And, uh, but I was already really popular there. And, um, then I stopped for a while. And then what happened was uh, a guy that was my friend for a lot of years over the last 25 years became the biggest selling act in the history of Japan. He sold over hundred million records and his name is Koshi Naba, and he has a band called the bees. So one day in 2016, I just get an email from Koshi, my, my friend Koshi, dear friend of mine. I played on his solo albums. He sang on my albums, played harmonica on. You ever hear a song of mine called Pumping It Up, that old Funkadelic song I cut? Go back yeah. and Google my version of it. That's Koshi playing harmonica on it. You know. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, so Koshi says, I'm really burned out. Here's the richest guy in the country. He's one of the richest guys in Japan. You know, I'm super burned out, but he doesn't act like it. You know, he rides around on an Indian motorcycle and he's like, he has, wears a t-shirt and He's not pretentious at all, but he's like, I'm super uninspired. I'm really depressed. I can't write. And he goes, do you think you'd want to fly over and try to write a song with me? And I'm like, yeah. So I went to the airport and I jumped on a plane and went to Tokyo and, and he's got, you know, he's got two studios with giant SSL and it's like good living. I get picked up with a driver and you know, you know, it's like, it's like for real. And I sit in the studio and we got a, we got a pro tool guy and we got, we got a, a musician that programs and we got the engineer too. I mean, it's like old school. It's like old days, the old days, you know, and uh, we start writing, but I say to him, I go, when I lived in London, England in 1987 and 88, when I was producing was not was and working with Terrence Strait Darby and these guys, I go, the music was like this weird funk pop. It was like pop music. Like when you listen to Kaja Gugu or you listen to Tears for Fears or you listen to Adam and the Ants or, it was like this funk, it was all funk, like with synth, you know, and and then a popping bass, like, you know, it's like popping bass and, and synth bass. And then I play like, totally, you know, it's all pretty much all I play. And then in the chorus, I play bam, a power chord or something, right? That's what, it's what you did. So I said, let's start with everything having synth bass, with slap bass again. Let's bring back slap bass. And let's make all the beats funky so you can dance to everything. And then I go, but then he loves the clash. But I go, let's make all the guitars sound like we, we're, we're in the clash. So it was just fun for fun. So I went all lo-fi on the guitars, and, you know, and then because I'm deep down, I'm a punk rocker, really, you know. And uh, we did these songs, and he, and, and he was like, we did three songs, and they were like incredible. And and then we and then he goes, want to come back and do it again? I'm like, yeah. So a couple months later, I flew back and we did three more. And then we did all of a sudden his manager goes, this stuff's coming out. Uh, can you get the record done in nine days? I'm like, record? What? Are you? It's like so I hauled ass home and 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 um, I went to uh, Tim Palmer, who's my neighbor, who's I've known for 20 years as a mixer, mixes uh, you know produced David Bowie and produced Robert Plant and Ozzy and uh, and we worked on Michael Hutchins' album together from NXS before Michael passed away. Or after after he passed away as well, actually, because the record came out after he died. Yeah, and, wow. Uh, so we so he mixed it. The record came out. It went gold in a day or two days. And they said we're touring, and the tour sold out in four minutes. It was like, so I got Amp Fiddler from Funkadelic on keyboards, who I grew up playing with with George Clinton. I got um, Stuart Zender from Jamiroquai to play bass, what? and I got um, Matt Sherrod from Beck and Crowded House to play drums, who works with me, been working with me for years. And we put together this super cool band of my friends and we went and did this massive tour of Japan in 2017. And, and ironically, Rumble came out at Sundance in 2017. We never thought it was gonna come out and we never thought it was gonna get in Sundance. So I'd already booked the tour. So I was in Japan and we won Sundance, Rumble won Sundance. So from Japan, I had to come in on camera to, to Utah to Sundance. So it was, a big, it was a big January, it was a big year. Um, but so I did this record with them, it was huge. And now we just did another one 
And um, we started writing in May and, and we do it old fashioned. We, we write and instead of writing and saying, this is great, let's put it out. We sit on it and then, and then we go, oh, this could be better. I remember I, I erased whole verses, whole verses of songs after three months of having them on there and rewrote new verses that the chorus was working with this verse could be better. And I, you know, you don't do that anymore. Most people now make a track, it's dope and they put it out. And we didn't do that. We waited, waited, waited. We really, really, we spent nine months working on it. Something like that. Um, people are freaked out. They're hearing the advanced tracks. And then Koshi calls me and he says, can you come to Japan in a couple of days? Um, he goes, they want us to do the cover of Rolling Stone. Do you want to do it? And I'm like, yeah, I want to do it. But I, but I need a week to lose five, 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, that's how it happened. So after all these years, I'd been in Rolling Stone magazine a few times in my life, but which was always exciting, right? That's the holy grail. But to be on the cover at 100 years old shows again to everybody, to everybody watching that anything is possible and anybody can do it. You just, you just got to keep, you got to think and you got to work a little harder and you got to really rethink, you know, so many kids now put music out that isn't ready yet. And, mm. and it, it's, it's, I wish that, you know, everyone thinks, you know how it is when you make a demo, you always go, this is dope. No one ever gives you a demo and says, this is shitty. But 90% 90, 90 of the time, the demos are shitty. Always shitty, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But you're always like, this is my new track. It's dope. And maybe it's going to be dope. You know what I mean? Yeah, it could. Like, it could be. Yeah. But it's not right now. <laughs> well, it is. Every once in a while, you get that one. But most of the time, it isn't. Most of the time, it's a work in progress. Taking your time, really thinking about where your melodies are, where that chord changes, where that bridge is, and how that is your song seven minutes, it needs to be four minutes or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the, a lot of that thought is gone now because there's not a lot of A&R and there's not a lot of artist development. And uh, I have a new label deal with Warner Brothers now and they, they're they super excited about me developing an, an Aboriginal label, a label of Aboriginal artists. And I'm gonna do it. Oh, wow, that's I mean, really Worldwide, cool. it's through Los Angeles, not through Canada, but it's through LA and it's global for the whole world. And uh, the problem is they they uh, they don't give you any money anymore. They just give you a global platform through the Warner system and in their office and their people and their marketing people and all that stuff. But um, yo, I, I need to link you with some of my friends. Do you know the guys from Portugal, the man? I don't know him, but I want to. Okay, I'm going to introduce you to John. Uh, John, the lead singer, is a good a good friend of mine. We we chat like once or twice a month. Uh, really, really, really good guy. Really smart. Uh, really wants to make a change, and uh, he, he's he's just here to help platform people. I got to introduce you to John. I want him to produce bands for me. I want him to develop shit. I want you to do it. I want all you guys to do it, right? I want, yeah, let's go. I want it to be real, though. I don't want to be. We're not here to do anyone any favors because by doing those, doing a favor like that is not doing them a favor and it's not helping us either because if everyone hears crappy music then they think is that the best you guys got then it makes it hard for them to listen to something that might be great because mm -hmm. well, i gave it a chance i want to love it but i've listened to five things that suck and then maybe the six thing is actually something amazing but you've you've lost your you've lost that guy's ear yeah, yeah. if eric if eric clapton kept uh uh saying other singers and, and endorsed other other guitar players who got shittier and shittier eventually you'd stop taking his advice exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and and it isn't hard it's really hard to be you know the, the the things that make the biggest difference in life and especially in in the arts but in life the tiniest tiniest details are what make the biggest difference that's what i've learned in my lifetime it's not the big mm. stuff. The big stuff's there. It's automatic. It's this teeny thing that sets you apart from making it and not making it. You know, why did the achy breaky heart was a giant hit for the one guy, but the guy who put it out eight months before it was a bomb. Right. What, right. He's one thing. And it was like, it was, you know, it was the biggest song of the year. And I don't like that song. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's a great song, but I'm saying that it was weird how some guy, one guy put it out the year before and it was bomb. Another guy puts it out. It sounds almost exactly the same. Uh, hey, I was going to ask you if you wanted to take a couple questions from people that might not have the chance to ever interact with you. Sure. And we have one here from Rina Takazawa. I believe uh, she's in Japan. She said, I want to see you at tour of Inaba Salazar. What's, it, what's she talking about there? Koshi Inaba. I mean, it's called Inaba Salas. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, it, so it says on the cover of Rolling Stone, Inaba Salas. And it's... 
They call it Anasara. Yeah, and hopefully huh. we're gonna try to be there. You know, we just we just I was supposed to be on tour right now, and we sold eighty thousand tickets in four minutes, and we had to give them all back. Wow. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's like buy a new house tickets. Yeah. 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 Real talk. Yeah. Wow. I feel uh, uh, bad now because I was complaining about my little small speaking gigs for my book and uh, to hear you. Oh, it all hurts. No matter how big or small, it all hurts. Real talk. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'll take any Real talk. You, but here's what I want to do. I want more people in Indian country to see Rumble. We made Rumble it was supposed to be a small little film with PBS that I was making as my the thing I did in my life, my one thing that was important that I could die after that. And I said I did something that was better than just me jumping around on a stage like a monkey with a guitar in my hand. I did something important. And it was for native people. It was supposed to be a small little film. We had no idea it was going to win Sundance. We had no idea it was going to. Now it's being taught in schools all across North America. It's a school curriculum. It's changed written history as we know it. But none of that, we, we didn't know any of that was going to happen. We made a film for Native people. It's their film. And I'm just finding now that Native people are still just getting around to seeing it. I, I, ha I hadn't heard of it. And like my mom loves, grew up on all the rock and roll that you're talking about. So I can't wait to take it to Saskatchewan. And, sh and watch it with my mom because I know how I Please. felt. I and felt so proud, about, man. You tell the world about it because that film was made for Native people. And now it's the world's film, but it's really was made for Native people. And I and I, I mean, I had a guy show up. We were, Christina and I were showing the film at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And um, there was one Native guy in the crowd. And I'm always looking, I'm always looking. And, and he was crying at the end of the film like a baby. And he came up to me and he was like, oh, I just never heard anybody ever say anything nice about <laughs> growing up about us. And it's like, and this is amazing. And I go, how'd you know about the film? He goes, I didn't. He goes, I was walking down the street and I saw the poster and I thought, what is that? I'll go see it. He had no idea. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I find that if we could find a way in Indian country to, to do what you're doing here and unify groups of people, because you have to unify people to have a movement. A real movement and 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 what and not a movement of everyone put their fist in the air you need that too but what you need is a movement that, that people see as an economical powerhouse because if you can then move the needle money wise then those people are oh shit we better listen to this even though that it, it's it, it, you have to that's the only way that's the only thing most of those people see and you have to if you can move the meter yeah, I can sell how much toothpaste to those people. That's, <laughs> that's you're you're totally right. That's how what happened with writers, indigenous writers in Canada. Cherie Dimeline dropped this book called Marrow Thieves, and it just like blew the doors open because she sold like a hundred thousand, which is like a million in the states, yeah. and then like yeah. it paved the way for all of us other writers to come through. Right, so you have to show that there's a, a an economical. I mean, why is there BET television? Because they said, look, you guys want to sell that uh, cocoa cream butter uh, and all that kind of stuff that, that, that all of uh, the African-American uh, people really love. Well, now we can put them in one, put it in one place and you can advertise to those people directly. And they gave them a TV channel. And then through that TV channel, then you can start spreading your culture about and you can start saying what's going on. You can start you can start showing the world, you know, good and bad. And you have a platform. But until you create that center where wall street which sucks it's freaking criminals if you you have to create that so they're because all they care about is money right yeah yeah yeah, Do that. yeah. you you like you guys build an audience here with this where you have a, thousands and thousands of people globally every you know every week you guys are going to do you know what you did though with that with that movie that was different than any other documentary or or native film really that i've seen before that especially documentary it's the historical content that, that that i feel is so powerful but you made us fucking cool bro like you like <laughs> link ray is cool as fuck and like oh yeah yo and like, that, that he 
That I've heard that so many times. That's in like Quentin Tarantino's movies, oh, yeah. like when like Vincent Vega's shooting up, and that's the sound. That, like it's just so badass. Like, and you're gonna go, oh, there's Link Ray. He used he, Quentin used Link Ray in Pulp Fiction. So I have a friend here in Austin, Texas, named Robert Rodriguez. He's a filmmaker, and Robert told me, yeah, we know Robert Rodriguez. Oh, okay. So Robert said, to me, <laughs> yeah, I'm, on, I'm on set with Robert, hanging out with him while he's shooting um, whatever the Dawn of the Dead or I don't know one of those movies, like the vampire movie. Or, and they're eating people and he calls me and goes bro get down here it's gonna be raining blood <laughs> it's like he's fucking he's a funny guy so he tells me he his first movie i think it's called road racer i think his first his first movie if you watch it now remember what he said about everything was invisible to us how do how do we not know about this if you watch that movie um the actor uh, arquette the guy the rosanna arquette's brother whatever he's he's telling the story to his girlfriend in the car and he says when I, got, when I grew up, I want to be like Link Ray. And she's like, Link Ray, who's that? And he goes, he's the coolest, blah, blah, blah. You know, this native guy, the coolest. It was there, we just never saw it. So he said to me, he told Tarantino, you have to put Link Ray in Pulp Fiction. So that's why he's in Pulp Fiction, okay? So wow. there you go. Wow. I, I want to give a shout out to Tanya Telega. She's uh, one of the aunties. Uh, celebrity authors that kick the door in for all of us younger authors uh, that's speaking to what you're talking about like creating like the economic incentive for indigenous uh, material and arts so it's and she's a big fan of yours she's a big yeah. fan yeah oh yeah yeah how cool is that um there's also a bunch of people like uh one person from japan and a big homie from australia an indigenous brother from australia are asking uh when they could see rumble or how they could see rumble in japan or australia rumble in japan um was coming out in may of this year and i was going to be there and uh, in canada's uh canada the canada embassy was throwing a huge event and a huge party for it but obviously coronavirus stopped all that so now we're talking about releasing we that we already dubbed it in Japanese and it's coming out maybe in maybe this summer in August we're trying to figure that out now but it's coming out in Japan soon now it came out in Australia but we had problems our distributor there was super cool um Christina Fon and I were down in Australia and it was sold out in these theaters and, and it was huge like and I'd, I'd ask her why are you all here it's, you know this is a film about Native American people and it was packed every night sold out three four hundred people and but he had a problem like in New Zealand and these places where, you know, Indians, the word Indians confused them. Um, they wanted to change the title because people in New Zealand, for instance, thought the Indians that rocked the world, they thought Rumble was a story about a band from India that uh, was trying to make it music. They had no idea, right? It was a marketing problem. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's, it's a, I don't know. We'd have to ask uh, Christina Fawn when we can when our deal's up in Australia and when we'll make another deal there. But it plays on NIT, N NITV there, which is the national, the Aboriginal channel they have there. It plays there a lot in Australia. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. That, you've toured Australia, yeah? Yeah. I produced that band down there called Yothu Yindi, too. They're amazing. Oh, dope. Well, do you know uh, Oka, the band Oka? We, no, we've, collaborated, we've collaborated with them on, uh, on the Hallucination album. And uh, the lead singer, like, yo, it's like family. But Stu, uh, he, he watches, he, he hangs out every week. And, uh, yo, big shout out, Stu. Uh, but, yeah, having, having those indigenous cousins, right, in, 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 in Australia, it's such a trip. Because, like, you, you meet these people who are exactly like you. Like, it's like, it's like walking into Bizarro World because yeah. they've gone through exactly the same thing that you have. They tell a story, and it's like, wait a minute, you, you, you. This happened to me this year. This happened to my grandfather. This happened to my grandmother. This happened to my great grandmother. And they did this and they did this and they did this and they did this. And you're like, wait a minute. It's exact. That's that's the, uh, the you know, that's the colonization madness. And I'm working on a new series right now. As a matter of fact, I got a call today about it because uh, about from an agent at CAA about it. But it's a new series about, um, as a matter of fact, I could use your guys' help because it's a series about young people. It's an, a series about indigenous people around the world. Now, most people, when you say the word indigenous, they just assume Canada and North America and Native American, North American Indians. I'm talking about white Indians in Finland. I'm talking about indigenous mm -hmm. people in Australia, New Zealand, and, 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 and Brazil, 
in, in, in yeah. Africa. South Africa, yeah. Uh, and so th there's it's a series about these young groups of different people. They're unrelated to each other, but they're all tired. They're young people that are no longer willing to be invisible. It's called Magnificent Invisible No More. And we developed it with Taboo from Black Eyed Peas. And uh, that's where we all started, me and Tab started getting the idea. And, and then James Burns got involved from, uh, who's the senior vice director at Vice in New York. And and um, Trevor White, who's produced The Wind River and produced The Post. And, and it's a series about these young, they're like freedom fighters. It's like they have nothing. They, they You got to be 28 years old and they're still living at your mom and dad's because you can't afford to buy a house. And and um, and they're and they're not taking it. They're not they're not willing to be like you know your grandfather said. Hey, just keep your head down and let's get through this. They're like fuck you. We're fucking. We, we've got something to say. And 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 it, and they and they all use it through the music is the language and the arts of the language you're using. But they're not like it's not a passive thing. A lot of these people are getting very aggressive. And uh, we're working on selling this new series right now, and it'll be a really incredible mini series, eight part kind of a thing. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, like, for instance, okay, here's a simple one. It's not even violent. Um, there's a group of kids in New Zealand, and they're Maori kids, but they don't want to do Maori music, man. They're into metal. They want to, they're want they into heavy metal, and they but they sing it in their language, and they call it bush metal, man. And it's like they want to sing it in the Maori language. And So I'm bringing Robert Trujillo down there. I'm in a band with Robert Trujillo from Metallica, and he's a, he's from Taos. He's a native. What? Yeah. Yo. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, Metallica, cool, but he was he was in fucking suicidal tendencies, bro. Yeah, like this was. is like, yo. Me and him grew up together. We used to play Madame Wong's together. So, what? so I play in his band called Mass Mental. He's got that side band called Mass Mental that's kind of freak out skateboard. Yeah. Band. You know, we do Lollapalooza and we'll play like we'll play an Ohio Players song and then go right into a set of Black Sabbath. It's like crazy. That's so wow. fun. So I'm bringing Trujillo down, and, he, and and these people sit together and they they talk and they collaborate with music and they talk about where they're from and their things. And, and, uh, and in each episode has someone like that in a collaboration effort where they talk about what they're going through in their life and their place and their goals and what's going on in their world, you know? Wow, man. Yo. I can't believe I'm talking to you, man. Like this is blowing <laughs> my mind. You know, my mind is blown, dude. And I, and I, and I try to take advantage of them and everybody that's with me is welcome to ride with me as far as I can go and hopefully pass me and take me, help take me places. Right. So that's, mm. that's the, it's like, uh, I, I, I don't know I just, if I have, to, this is what I can do right now. So I'm going to do it, but I'll, I, you know, I could be, I could be, I could strike out two months from now or two years from now. And everybody's like, what, I just want people to remember after I'm dead that I did one thing great, you know, mm. from, yeah, if you're like, looking no, for a writer, I'm right here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can write to go check my book out. So. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, Stevie, last time, like last like uh, time I was a part of any like award show or anything like that, it was the Junos here in Canada, and we had uh, Tanya Tagak and Buffy uh, open and talk and do things like before our our presentation or our yeah whatever. We opened the Junos too, which was really cool. Yeah. But backstage before uh, we went on, Buffy was there with us, and she was like, uh, you know, this used to be really really lonely back here. And like it, it feels really good to finally have because we had all these Indians with us, right? Yeah. And yeah. I just want to know, like, you've been in the music game since like the '80s. Like, have you noticed a significant change for Indigenous music and people recognizing like Indigenous music? And and what has that been like? I've noticed a lot of it since I started coming to Canada because in North America, there's no support, and not just for, for Aboriginal artists. There's no support for artists in America. It's a very capitalistic, you know you got to figure it out right it sucks it really sucks because now in america everyone just money is the new god you know in the old days the, the rich people realized that without the arts you could not have a proper civilized environment now everybody's just like and it's un look how uncivilized it is you know everybody's like money how much you know someone says to me how much did you get how much money was that oh man you got that's a lot of money 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 i'm so sick of it you know and when i started coming to canada it was like oh I'm sort of, I have never been around so many Native people. I was living on Six Nations and I walked down the street and Native people would drive by and I'd go, wow, they're everywhere. This is awesome. I loved it. It was a great feeling. And I can understand how Buffy could see that because I remember Buffy putting together her all Native band with Jesse Green and, and Michael Michael Money Do and all the guys. And, and uh, she wanted to do that. And that she didn't have to do that. And she did it on purpose. She was trying to uplift some people with her. 
and um, she wanted to, so she, she did that. And what was the name of that band? Because they were a band um, yeah, by themselves. I used to go see him in Winnipeg. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, because Money Do's brother was the singer, Donovan. And uh, was it like Lost Ones or something like that? I can't remember. Anyway, sorry, sorry, man. I didn't but mean to put cool. you on. I used to go see them all, all the time, you know, because they'd play at that place in Winnipeg, the, 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 the I forget what it's called, but it was like some the pyramid. Pyramid, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, you know, the, the native thing in, in one place, what concerns me, I have a little concern about some things. Like, for instance, I see a lot of native people playing events and, and being like, here we are, we're playing this thing. We're all like, we, we're all, we're all, we've all made it, but there's like no people there. And I'm like, wait a minute, guys. That's not that's not acceptable. Um, there has to be a way that you have to worry work on rallying people there, and not just native people. But when I don't see native people, I mean, George Leach when he put, when he won the Juno that year, somebody told me he had an after party afterwards, and there was like nine people there. I'm like, well, where is everybody? You know, you got to support. You got to support a little more, and and you also can't be confused that just because maybe the government gives you money to go play a festival around the world. You still got to go there and earn it. You got to, you know, and I can play those festivals. Somebody's paying for me to be there and I'm getting paid. And, and if I could get somebody else to pay for it, for me to be there, I would, would do it in a minute, but I would still take that moment as an opportunity to like, how do I make, take this opportunity and turn it into something big, not just go there to play. Cause you've got to promote, you got to promote, you got to promote. And if you're not reaching people, do you have to change your way of promoting? You have to really think about what do I got to do? And that's what a lot of people need to do is you have these opportunities. You have, you have the government sponsoring your, you to go places and doing things. Okay. Well, if you're knocking on the door and no one's opening, then you got to go to the next door and start knocking. You can't just keep knocking on and say, Oh, that's racism. Or, or, you know, because, or you got to think about, am I making the best record I can make? Am I, am I, you know, when, you could see it. You could see it when you were in tribe, you guys all of a sudden start getting calls to play all over the world. You're selling tickets then. Nobody calls you to play all over the world if you're not really selling tickets, right? You got to sell tickets and, you, and it's a harsh reality and it's it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about. But all of us have to do it. And I show up sometimes somewhere and I'll be like, God damn, there's nobody here. What the hell do I got to do? You know? What do you think that has to do with like a, a um, you know, a, a chain in the system that that's you know, falling apart. Like we don't have uh, enough indigenous party promoters. We don't have enough indigenous um, agents, enough indigenous, um, you know, managers and so on and so forth to, to coordinate these after parties, to, to, to get hype up. Like, maybe. do you think that that's, that's the problem? Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe part of the problem is... Um, no label support? <laughs> definitely that. You know, when, yeah. I, was, when I was a kid, um, you, you, the labels, you leaned on the label for everything. Um, in 1987, I got my first development deal at AM Records. And John Carter, who produced Tina Turner, he was like an AR guy. And he said, uh, Stevie, you look really interesting. Yeah, you're a native guy. And you got this weird mix of, you do, it's funk, but it's rock. I mean, it's kind of different than, you know, here's 20 grand. Go into the studio, work with these guys, come back and see me in a month. And then I come back and see him in a month. And, and sometimes he'd be like, this sucks. This song sucks. Then you'd be like, this one's interesting. Why don't we, there's another 10 grand. Why don't you go, you know, and then work in this direction and you make a call. Can you work with this? And I, it would be my choice to say, go to hell. Or it'd be my choice to say, okay, let me listen to what this guy has to say. You know, when I, I was in a bidding war in Island Records and I was in a bidding war. I get the biggest deal Island had ever given a new artist. And Tony Berg, the producer, who later on became an A&R guy and you know, worked with Beck and worked with everything, he was a producer. And he came to my house to talk to me about producing my first album. And he listened to my demos. And I just was in a bidding war, okay? A bidding war. I'm big shit. Bill Graham's my manager. I am. My, my ego's this big. He says to me, what are you singing about? He goes, have you ever read a book? This is straight up diss. I mean, he straight up insulted me. Have you ever read a book? And he said it like that, like, what the hell is this? And wow. first instinct was like, get the fuck out of my house. My second instinct was like, I better shut up and listen. 
and I shut up and I listen. And when I listen back to those songs he listened to, maybe 80% of them never made my first album anyways. He was right. I was wrong. And he did me a favor. And I listened to him and I didn't want to listen. I wanted to punch him in the face, but I listened to him. And so maybe we have to really think about collaboration. What made Rumble great? The collaboration of Catherine Bainbridge and her way of thinking about racism and, and stuff and, and my way of thinking about heroes and, and my phone book that could reach superstars and, um, and then the superstars that vouched for us. It's a collaboration, a constant collaboration, you know, and search. If you ever find one thing about me that you're going to find out, and it's the most important thing that's been led to any success that I've had, I try to find the greatest people that are doing the coolest shit and I glom onto them. And if I can be the shittiest guy in the room or the shittiest guy in the car, that's where I want to be because I'm going to listen. I'm going to learn and I'm going to figure out what they do and I'm going to fucking go, you know, and I don't want to be the big shot. I don't want to be the big guy in the room. That's the kiss of death. I relate with that so much of what you're saying. You're like, you have to collab man in a positive way and, Work don't towards collab with something. somebody who just kisses your ass either. Yeah, like, yeah. How great you are. <laughs> yeah, they got to critique you, right? And be honest. And if yeah. you trust them, how many times have any of you guys? I mean, you, you trusted your editor, right? Your editor did. edited your book. You yeah. know, this what you said. You trust, why pay the guy? How many times have you had a record producer and he tells you to do something? You know, nah, we don't do it that way. We do it this way. And then that album bombs, right? It's like, why hire a guy? But make sure you hire, you know, sometimes we hire the wrong guys. That happens. You make some mistakes, you got to fall off and you got to get back up again, too. That's another thing. You get your ass kicked, you better learn how to get back up. You got to have, yeah, yeah. Skin. It's like us here. We got, uh, you know, we we got Kim making all the decisions now. We got Tanya Talaga making the, the, the decisions. Surrounded so, like, smart people. That's yes. right. And plus, look at Kim's hair. It's like <laughs> in a TV commercial. That alone, she's like, wins for me. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely well stevie i could keep you here all day and listen to your stories um i feel like we took up way too much of your time already um thank you for coming honestly it's been it's been awesome bro this has been so so uh important i i really appreciate you sharing sharing this time with with us um yeah, if yeah. if you have time, Stevie, would you would you come back and and hang I'll out for something? I can. I'm 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 in. I came. I told myself in 2006 I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life. I had a really fortunate first half of my life in, in the career I had, and I dedicated the second half of my life to 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 Indian country. I want to learn more. I want to get to know who I am more as a human being, and I need help with that. And I want to teach people and give people what I know if they're willing to really accept it and learn. You know. So yeah, mm. I'm down. I'll do whatever. I'm down with this. Yeah, this yeah. stuff is what I do. This is what I live for. The rest of the stuff I do. So if I can do a TI album with Justin Timberlake, then a new a young hip hop kid listens to me and actually might listen to what I tell him, as opposed to if I didn't do that, he might think I'm full of shit and some dinosaur. So it's important <laughs> that I doing those current kind of things, you know. Doing Dead and Gone and TI was that perfect example of I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I I worked with on a Public Enemy record. I played, like I told you, played with DMC. I played with a lot of. Really what did you do on a Public Enemy re record? I played, I played guitar on uh, Welcome to the Terror Dome. On the... No, you did what? not. I grew up with that. Yeah, well, I did. I'm on the remix for. I'm on the remix on the on the ESPN Extreme Game soundtrack. That's me. I did all. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I know that same remix. Track, same track. Yeah, Welcome to the Terror Dome. Yeah. Okay, so I know a bit about that. So, but I didn't. I walked. Justin Timberlake called me to go to the studio and play on a track. And I went and in, walked in the record plant and I didn't know who T.I. was. And I, I, he brought some food and he asked me if I want some food. And I thought he was just an assistant at the record plant. And he gave me some Chinese food and I played on Dead and Gone and some other song. I didn't even know what those were. And then the record came out and people were like, oh, yo, man, T.I., respect. Again, I had no idea who he was. But I do now. <laughs> <laughs> I, got the gold, I got the platinum albums on my wall. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. But what, it, what T.I. did was it made it to where I can go speak to some kids in the street and they listen to me. They, they're going to respect if I tell them they should be a better dad. You know, mm. it's like I had to talk with Dreesus one time. I go, Dreesus, when's the last time you called your kid? You know, Dreesus, Dreesus could twist my neck and pull my head off. But he's like, he, he listened to me. You know what I mean? And it's something Yo, that 
and being able to do some of those things that they can relate to so you can so your words mean something to them mm. Dude. a lot of those artists those rap artists like you know they were they were doing a lot of heavy hard gangster like real real rap yeah. Um, and then Ad I don't know more happened, I feel like, and then everybody like went into like full on, like indigenous heritage pride. Let's, let's go, let's get, let's get it together. Right. Kind of thing. Right on. Yeah. That's yeah. Good, you know, change. Everybody's got to evolve, right? Everybody evolves, but we all got to stay together and we all got to listen to each other, but we all got to also keep surrounding ourselves with the best people. And I don't care if that person is green, purple, black, silver. I don't give a shit. If I can learn something from them, I, I want to be around them. And, uh, and and I want to bring it back to who I am and teach my son and teach uh, other people that are willing to learn. You know, yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you with one thing. This is mm. the thing I always I think about all the time. I always think if if you think you're great, know that you can be greater. And I I think that if you you have a dream, never give up, because the day that you quit might be the day before that dream comes true. And, and me being on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine last month is a perfect example. I never thought I'd ever be on the cover of Rolling Stone. I'm old now and my days are behind me. So you just never know. You never know. See, they don't write songs about just being in the Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> I actually, they write yeah. songs about being on the I cover. The Rolling Stones, and now I'm on the cover of Rolling Stone, yeah. Dude, this was like talking to like a real life Jedi, man. Thank you. You're like a native Jedi. Thank Dude, you. Dude, okay, I'm not a native significant. Jedi. I'm Star Wars like crazy. Me and my son. And and remember when Luke, when Luke gets first meets Obi Wan and he's like, and he goes, Luke, let go. Your eyes will trick you. Okay, when I'm a music director, and I used to tell this to the kids at music at American Idol, and and even when I was a music director for Mick Jagger or something, I say. Your eyes will trick you. You got to close your eyes, and when you play, it's the force. You use the force. As soon as I look and I think, I'm a millisecond off whatever I'm doing, and that's where you fuck up. You, you yeah. got to let it just flow through. You got to like your eyes will trick you, big time. Absolutely, um, Stevie. Do you have anything you want to plug? Do you have uh, um? Where, where can people find you? Where, where is there anything on the, the internet? Yeah. You know, I'm on Instagram and I'm on uh, Stevie Solace official and, and on Facebook and on uh, Twitter and all that stuff. Um, but I'm really getting sick of all that stuff. But I mean, it's a necessary evil. I'm just getting so tired of it. It's getting really, I want to do something else. I want something. I'm going to create TV, but you know, Stevie Solace.com. But you know, most people reach me on Instagram and on um, Facebook. Actually, You should start oh, streaming. Oh, the old people get me on Facebook. The young people get me on Instagram. That's <laughs> you should start streaming, though. Like, honestly, like these stories and just like interacting. Like, it would be if you're looking for something new that's along the lines of TV. Because, yo, because of COVID, it, 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 like everybody's on the same playing field. Yeah. But right? I, like, I, I just don't like doing it. Oh, fair. <laughs> you know what I, mean? <laughs> I like talking to cool guys and I like it's interesting to like talking to you guys. I thought it'd be really fun. But I get, I get asked to do a lot of stuff and I don't really want to do I want to go surfing. You know, I want to go, I want to go chase, I want to go, you know, searching for Black Rhino and the Maasai Mara, you know, I want to, I want to make hit TV shows and I want to, you know, I don't want to make another rumble, but I want to do something else that's really great. You know, it's like, I want to see rumble expand and, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to sit around and talk about myself all day, but I do want to, I'm going to do the new record label and I'm going to want to do a lot with that and I'm going to need some help. And I'm going to search you guys out. And I'm, I'm, when I'm dead serious, I'm not going to put anything out that isn't at a level that can compete with the best stuff in the world. So if you're going to, if you're a singer like Justin Timberlake, then you need a record record that's as good as Justin Timberlake. Otherwise, there's no excuse. You know, it's good. You know, when people always say, oh, but it's the best thing on APTN. I go, what the hell's that got to do with anything? Mm -hmm. you know, we're trying to be the best. That's right. That's yeah. right. I love it. I love it. Okay, Stevie, we're gonna we're gonna let you go. Jesse and I have a little bit of uh, uh, house cleaning to do here, but uh, yo, really, really appreciate hanging out and and uh, chatting with us. I see, uh, you guys. see you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank see you. you again, bro. Take care. Bye, bro. Whoa. Right. I can't, I can't believe that. <laughs> like, dude, the whole time, the whole time it was just like one thing after another. I'm like, man. I can't that believe this. So this fun. is like a dream. This is a dream. Was, like, that was a lot of fun. I can't wait. I'm gonna. We're gonna bring him back. We're gonna bring him back to like jump in on like 
on, on a yeah. conversation like with Tanya and stuff. Yeah, he'll yeah, be like one awesome. of the uh, the uncles that come to the table. That would be good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be really cool. That'd be really cool. So, um, yeah, next Friday, because this is a, a Friday, uh, a weekly now, uh, we have Rena Owen from the hit TV series Siren. But you might remember her from the uh, the most famous movie of my childhood, other than Bill and Ted, Once We're Warriors. Um Maori movie about Maori culture and trying to figure out what it means to be indigenous in a, in a colonized state. Beautiful movie, brilliant. Um, my name is DJ Indian, also known as Big Migs, also known as uh, Megezi Beboyad. And I am the Thistler, otherwise known as uh, Electric. That was my old stage name in the 90s. I was probably the Thistler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Electric. Ela trick. Yo, did you yeah. have a tag for it? Did I did everything. It? And I would Man. get up and I'd freestyle in front of everybody. I wasn't that good, but like I tried, right? We're going to make a record together. Oh yeah, we should. <laughs> yeah, <I> should. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a lot of fun. Okay. Um, thank you so much, everybody that watched. Um, if you like this, please share it. Uh, it's going to go up on homies chatting uh, YouTube channel. Um, you can find us there if you missed it and want to share it again. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Uh, bum up Pete. Oh, wait, we didn't do the, the, the history oh, yeah. of the day. Yeah. Um, homies, I totally forgot. I was starstruck. Homies yeah, me history. too. This time, uh, this day in 1885, uh, Gabriel Dumont, resistance fighter, Métis resistance fighter, went to Montana to get Real, Louis, Louis Real, to be the spokesman for the Northwest resistance. Uh, that would happen the following year. So they were fighting against white supremacy. They were fighting against Canadian expansion on the prairies. They were trying to protect the bison. And they went to go get uh, uh, Real. And so I just want to honor that because it's very apropos from what's going on all over North America right now. We have to resist. We have to fight. It's in our blood as Métis, Cree, Nehea, Anishinaabe people. So... That's my moment in history. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I like that one. Um, I have a word of the day. And uh, it, it, I wish I, I would have done this while, while Stevie was still here. But the word is Mdwewe uh, Shigen. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a word that means like a sound maker. Mdwewe. If you hear like wewe, it typically means like a sound or like a... Yeah, and that Ndwewe means like a sound, and Chigen means like thing or maker or or something like that. So it's like a, it means instrument, but it's also mm. the word that we use for guitar. Mm -hmm. So Ndwewe Chigen is like a, a a guitar or it's just a, a music instrument. It's a sound maker is is the the breakdown for that word. How do you say that? I want to Ndwewe. Ndwewe Chigen. Ndwewe Chigen. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So Thank you. You'll see Shigin come up all the time. That means like thingamajig. Yeah, yeah. Like it means like the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it on signs all over Ontario. Actually. Yeah. 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 Cool. Like Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. 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 Oh, <laughs> <laughs> unpacking, right? We're learning every day. This is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, lots, cool. lots, lots to do with that. So again, thank you so much, everyone that watched. Um, we're gonna put this up on YouTube and uh yo, come hang out next week with the homies. Bama P.